I'm ready to honor God in my tithes and my offerings. God causes the overflow in my life. And when I'm in the overflow, those that are around me, they get to partake of the overflow. And they're blessed, I'm blessed, they're blessed, everything I touch is blessed. Amen? And too is blessed. Glory to God. So we're going to receive our offering tonight. Pastor Sherry. Amen. <laughs> Good stuff already. Amen. Praise God. Well, ushers are around. I always know they're buzzing. There's Pastor Dave over there. And uh, let's go over to do, uh, Genesis chapter 30. Genesis 30. And, um, you know, I just, in praying over the offering tonight, we like to give you food that will feed your spirit on the word of God concerning prosperity. Amen? Amen. And, um, you know, tithe is worship unto the Lord. So it's part of the worship time. Amen? And, and in the Old Testament, they lifted up their offerings and they waved them before the Lord. And, and we want to teach our children how to honor the Lord the the lord it's the it's his monies amen and everything belongs to him we know that but let's look over here in genesis 30 and we're looking in verse 25 and, and i just want to share with you that there's no limits to what god can do in our finances and uh, dr john kind of touched on that this morning how the old devil dog would try to limit even through his employer but, you know, you keep that sweet spirit and you walk in the fruit of the spirit. Amen. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit will, he will give you creative ways to be blessed. And I love the story because there's a number of things that, uh, that the Lord did here. But let's look just for a few moments here. And we see that, you know, Rachel and Joseph are in love. Remember, they were just in love. And um, in verse 26, it says, Give me my wives and my children from whom I have served you, and let me depart from yourself. Know my service which I have rendered you. you. And so what happened is Joseph worked for a long time to marry the love of his life, and the father-in-law cheated him. Remember the story. And so he worked longer to get the love of his life, Rachel. And so then we see here in verse 27, but Laban, Laban said to him, if now it pleases you to stay with me, I have de divined that the Lord has blessed me on your account. So he's a blessing magnet. Joseph is. Amen. And so that's, you know, there's been times that I've walked into restaurants and people know us, they know that we're ministers in stores, and there's been no customers. And uh, they'd be a little discouraged, and I said, oh, don't worry about it. They'll, you'll have bunches of them. By the time I leave, you're going to have a full house. And they come over and start laughing because they have a, a packed house, and we're there maybe 30 minutes. And, and they said, how is that? How can you say that? I said, because the Lord is good. And he's wanting to show you that he can move mightily if you serve him. And they get blessed. Amen. We had a store that they, they had nobody all day. Nobody the whole day. And we were witnessing to them. And I, and, and I said, you watch. We're here, and the Lord is going to bring in customers. And, and when the Lord brings in customers, I want you to say, praise the Lord. And they said, well, I sure will. And we were talking, and in that, just that short amount of time, about 10 customers came in. And one guy, he was just like cha-chinging on that credit card, and the guy was looking at me going, what do we do? And he's like, praise the Lord. <laughs> And so God wants to prove himself, amen? And so, but he also wants to prove himself in our own pocketbook, right? Amen. And so I remember one time, Pastor Steve and I were working in another ministry. It wasn't this ministry. And our pastor was learning prosperity. And actually, we were teaching him about prosperity. And he's admitted this. And he said, you know, the Lord really used us. But there was a time that we had a salary. But, you know, anybody ever heard of Pentecostal handshakes? I love Pentecostal handshakes. Actually, we had one today, praise God. And uh, so we, we were believing God. We were like you guys, hardly had enough money to pay even attention to, you know. <laughs> and so we were hurting in the financial realm, but we've got faith. 
And faith is the substance of things hoped for. Amen? And so don't ever be discouraged if hey, they lay you off or the, the, the devil will use someone to say something negative. But remember, we've got faith. And they can't beat us with our faith. We Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. Amen? And so uh, we were getting pretty blessed in the church. And so uh, one of the pastors says, well, you know what? You need to start reporting to us. Now, don't get mad, okay? This is what you go through. You go through things so that you can go through and be tested, tried, purified, and passed to the next level. And so we were getting a hold of the prosperity, and we were getting excited. And uh, But then the devil threw a little old monkey wrench in there. And, and so the pastor came to us and said, you know, you guys are getting blessed. And so I want you to start because we would read report to him when we did get blessed anyway because we felt like it was integrity. Hey, we got blessed with this, we got blessed with that. And so he said, well, from now on, whenever they bless you with, I'm going to deduct out of your salary so that, you know, you could, <laughs> yeah, I'm not that fun. I thought you loved that. I thought, you, I, thought, I thought I'd get a good kick out of the looks on your faces too. <laughs> and so we were like, oh, all righty then. And so we would what do we do? We just did what the Word of God says. So over here, Laban says, you know what? I'm going to bless you, but I want you to have speck. You, the only way we're going to separate these calves is there's going to be speckled and there's going to be brown. Remember that? And so, so Joseph says, well, you pick the color. And he had the attitude, is God's going to bless me. I don't care if they're purple and green. God's going to bless Well, that's my translation. But that's what God's going to do. God's going to bless me. And so, you know what? You know the story. You can read it, 25 through 35. So he picked a certain color. And I'm telling you, all the colors came for Joseph. And Laban got upset. And he says, well, you know what? There's just too many of this color. I'm switching. And so Joseph said, that's fine. Go ahead and take the, the brown ones or the spotted ones. You pick whichever one you want. God is with me, and God moved every time. And that's what we did when our pastor says, you know what, we're going to have to deduct it from your salary. We said, okay, that's okay. The Lord's still going to move. The Lord's going to move because he's our source. God is our source. Amen? And if we can get it with our faith, then we can get it. Right? Because faith is the substance of things hoped for. Sometimes, you know what? We think about too much on money. We don't have to pay for everything with money. Amen? Amen? Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. You know, I remember we were needing a great copy machine for the ministry, and we kept buying copy machines, and they weren't really up to standard. And I says, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of spending, you know, $150 on one object. I want a, I want a you know, mammoth of a copy machine. And so we just called it in, me and Pastor Gina. We were dealing with, the, you know, believing over that, dealing with that. And so we just called it in. And within a matter of maybe three to six months, we got a $5,000 Cadillac copy machine. I mean, this will make a book for you in about five minutes. It just prints seven copies, bam, 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 staples them. I mean, we're talking a professional deal. And I know the person, they baby the copy machine. And we didn't have to pay a penny for it. God brought it in. And there's some time, yeah, we've never said a word. Sometimes the Lord will say, don't, don't uh, believe for that with money. Call it in. Yeah. What do you need? What do you have a need of? You know, God delights to show off his creativity. And so we just said, well, that's okay, Pastor. We understand. We know we're all growing in prosperity. The Lord will move for us anyway. And so we just said, okay, Lord, now you heard, you heard what just happened. Now we're getting blessed, and, and the Lord's using men to bless us. Well, now you're going to have to just, we're going to have to make the circle a little smaller in the blessing. And so we just said, we call in the monies, and it won't be from anybody that we know in the church. So we won't have any deductions out of our paycheck. And sure enough, God started bringing in uh, repairs for our car, brand new tires for our car. I, I remember one time I was believing God just for a new outfit to preach in and you know what I heard a knock at the door I had a whole outfit shoes and everything I mean the sky is the limit with our faith and no one can hinder us when we believe amen and so what I love is the Lord loves us and he's always on our side 
And maybe people won't be. Maybe people get jealous sometimes about what we have. We should be an advertisement. The blessing of the Lord should be such in a way for us that we are advertising how good God is. But you know what? I want to challenge you on your faith tonight to believe. Don't let your bosses hinder you. Don't let the standard of what you're getting paid hourly be the standard that you're believing for. Believe for it all. And when you check it and go, Holy Spirit, was that everything we needed? Oh yeah, I need to write in that college tuition that's paid for for my five children. Amen? I need to go ahead and put my retirement package because God is a big God. And he says, what are you believing for? You have not because you ask not. And, and, and you know, I found that God makes a way better list than I do. He gives things that I don't have a clue I'm going to need later. Amen? And that's where I love in Matthew. says, you give us this day our daily bread. Amen? And he knows what the bread that we need. There may be something that we need, and money will never touch it. But the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich, and he adds no sorrow to it. Amen? And so are you ready to give? I want you to rev up your faith tonight. Amen? Let's ignite it, and let's believe God over our finances. And if there's things that are in your life, feeling attacked. I don't know where this is going to get paid or how this bill is going to be covered. God's got it. Yeah. Amen. And, and if all we have is our mouth, praise the Lord, that'll get the job done. Hear the word of God and it will change our situation. Amen. And so we thank you, Father God, for the blessing of the Lord. We thank you that we are the blessed people of God. It was your idea. We didn't concoct it or create it. You decided to bless us. And you love us. We are your apple of the eye, Father God. And thank you that when you created us, not only did you say it was good, you said we were very good. It was a blessing to be with man. And so, Father, we thank you that you are our Heavenly Father. And we take the offering, excuse me, that we have in our hand right now, and we declare that it will feed many people. It will bring in the lives of people that need to be saved, changed, turned, and have miraculous happening in their lives. And Lord, we thank you that all the needs of our life and our church is met. Every bill is paid, and we curse lack right now. Devil, you take your filthy fingers off our finances. We believe God, and we know that our Father shall supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. Not according to our thoughts, mentality, or the riches in Bronx, New York, but according to your riches, Father, in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for putting a bigger picture on the inside of us that you truly are our source. Bless the gift and giver today. Press down, shaken together, and overflowing. Amen. Do you see the Lord blessing us? Do you see be yourself being a blessing also? Amen. We see that. We see the full picture. Amen. Bless it, Lord. Bless it now in Jesus' name. Amen. And we thank our ushers for st stepping up here, and we'll just plant our seed in the front. Amen. If you have an offering, praise the Lord. If not... Thank the Lord and be an offering to him in yourself. Amen. Well, at this time, we'd like to dismiss our kids, be blessed, have fun. And we invite you to stand and let's praise the Lord.
Praise God. Hallelujah. You're blessed. And amen, amen. Somebody say, amen, I'm blessed. Amen. All right. Oh, no, I'm getting carried away with that. Sorry, Dr. Don. And I act cool. Oh, uh, yeah, not in yours, though. I'm going to be careful in your church. <laughs> anyway, y'all may be seated. God bless you. Um, I, I don't know how many of you were here. I know I recognize some faces here this morning. Mark Becky, it's good to see you guys. Love y'all. Um, but we had a great uh, teaching and message and flow of the spirit this morning. And um, t tonight we're going to see some fire of the Holy Ghost as, as uh, Dr. Rebecca comes and shares some things and Dr. John himself. And uh, we're going to flow together, amen, in the spirit tonight. So um, who's first or you want to both come? Dr. Rebecca, let's welcome her. Good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to see you tonight and great to be in the house of God right down here in beautiful Clearwater Beach, Florida. Sure beats that up north. <laughs> All right. You know, probably the most important thing that we can talk about in our life is prayer. And prayer is just, uh, it does so many different things in so many different realms. And it can do, it can just change our lives tremendously. Tonight I want to open up by sharing with you about two patterns of prayer. And when we get, when I get done, then John's going to come and take us into a, a deeper realm of that second part of prayer. But tonight I'd like you to open up to Psalm uh, 5. And let's look at David. I'm just a personal fan of David. I appreciate him not because I think he was just perfect because we all know he certainly wasn't. But one thing he was is he was a man who drew near to the heart of God. He was a man of faith. He was a man of repentance. He was a man of confessing the word of God. And he loved the word of God. You know, oftentimes when God wants to make a man a God, it seems that God puts him on the backside of a desert. He did it with Moses and he did it with David. And David learned some things differently than Moses did. Moses was out in the backside of the desert and he was learning what it was to have be humbled. He was learning what it was to trust God. He was learning what it was to have a shepherd's heart and to love people, to care for people. And so God put him out there with all those stinky sheep. Amen. Yep. But with David, it was something different. He was out there with the stinky sheep as well. Amen. But he had to learn two things. He had to learn to be a warrior and he had to learn how to worship. And so imagine yourself by yourself out on the backside of that desert and learning. It was a common thing for people of that day to put their children out and to learn to be shepherds. That was their primary function, their primary role of uh, way of prospering in that time and in that day. And so guarding the sheep was very important. And so David had to be on the backside of the desert and he really learned an intimacy with God. Now, I don't know if any of you have been through scary situations in your life. I'm not going to ask you to hold your hand up. But I'd like to tell you I've been through a couple in my life where you felt like, you know, I don't know if I'm going to make it through this or not. The Bible better be true. And so uh, it, was, it was a scary thing. But one thing I learned was that God was there. I learned how to call upon the name of the Lord. I learned how to have faith in him, and I learned how to trust in him. And so David learned a lot of those same things in the heat of the day, in the middle of the night, and when there were bears, and when there were lions, and you had to number the sheep, and you had to protect the sheep. And guess what the gate of the sheep was? You. There was a sheepfold, and they would bring the sheep in at night, and, and the sheep would have to pass underneath the hand of the shepherd, and he would have to feel them and find out if there were insects on them, if there were bites, if there were wounds, if there were infections. He had to learn all those things. And then after he counted all the sheep as they passed underneath his hand going in, then he had to lay down himself across that entranceway into that rocky sheepfold, and he became the gate. And when you're the gate to anything, and I just tell you right now, this is a gate church. 
That means, what does that mean to be a gate church? It means that the things that come into the city have to pass through us. Amen. They pass through us. And that's why it's so important to know war when you're a part of a gate sh ch church because the enemy wants to come through into the city. And do we let him come in? No. Do we? What kind of vile spirits are trying to get in? Are there gambling spirits trying to come in? Be here? Were they here when you came? You know, what kind of spirits are here? Those things. And so we, the shepherds, lay across the gate, uh, across the entrance of the sheepfold, and we determine what comes in and what goes out. Right. Women, let me just tell you, as managers in your home, guess what? You're the ones who determine what comes in and goes out, that goes out of your home. And so understanding war and understanding the power of prayer can benefit the, us tremendously. So David was good at this. He learned it on the backside of the desert. He learned when he was, was lonely, when he was cold, when he was afraid. He learned what it was to sing to God. He learned how to lift his voice and to uh, you know, allow what was in his heart to go forth to God. And a lot of times that's one of the hardest things for some of us to learn to do is to literally open our hearts before God because we don't open our hearts to anybody. And the reason we don't is because we learned a long time ago nobody really cares about the state of affairs of our heart. We didn't know that God did, and because everybody else shut us down, I had a woman one time in our ministry, she would begin a sentence, and you never got to interrupt because she would say the sentence, and, and go into the next oh, sentence. Yeah. And finally, I asked her one day, see people heal. She said, when I was a little girl, she said, my father duct taped my mouth because he said I talked too much. And so I wasn't allowed to express myself. So now she, she had to connect every sentence with another sentence so that she could get her heart out. And see, we've learned that as a lot of times as children. Shut up. I, don't, I can't hear you right now. And so we go before God and we feel like God's saying, shut up, I got the whole universe to care for. <laughs> you think I care about your little problem? <laughs> and I'm here to tell you, he does. And so learning to open up the whole depth of our heart, it, it just makes that praying so powerful and it makes the intimacy that brings his presence. And it's so wonderful. David learned that on the backside of the He learned how to worship. And he learned how to war. When those bears and the lions came against him, he, he knew how to have faith and how to beat that thing with a club. Do you know they had a club? I wish I had mine with me. Someone had one made for me one time. And they were weighted in the end. They're a stick, but they're weighted in the end uh, with a heaviness. And so, you know, I thought you just went like this and whacked the lion whack the bear and that wasn't it you had to stand at a distance and you had to learn to twirl that thing and it didn't go this way it went over over with that weight and you had to judge it so that by the time it got to that bear or that line that beamed it right on the head <laughs> training for war there were so many things that David learned on the backside of the desert and you may be on the backside of the desert. You may feel like that. And I just want to tell you that if you do, it's because God's got a plan for you. And he's teaching you how to war. He's teaching you how to have an intimacy with him. So that's what happened. Okay, let's turn the, having turned to Psalm 5. That was a long prelude, wasn't it? Okay. Psalm 5. I like to give a background to things. Here's David. Give ear to my words, O Lord, and consider my meditation. Oh, he was such a man of the word. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray, and my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. Now I want to give you, bring your attention here to two words, and uh, the first being a phrase, and that is, in the morning. And in in the morning, did you see is there twice? Now, some people say, well, that means morning by morning he was doing that. But I think also it means that um, because it's there twice, he wants us to have attention to the fact that praying in the morning is very powerful. It sets the tone for the rest of your day. It creates an alertness in you as to what things you may be facing. You can talk to God. God can talk to you. He can tell you things that are coming that day. And so in the morning is very, very powerful. He says it twice. So we see a pattern there. 
And then number two is uh, the significance of the word direct. He says, this morning, I will direct my prayer to you. And the word direct here is a word that the priests used in the Old Testament. You really see it over in Exodus chapter 40, or chapter 20, rather. And, and there he was talking about the very fact that the priest would set in order a table to worship God with. And a, a table of intercession as well. But everything had to be in a certain order. And so David was saying here, in the morning, you know, you're going to hear from me. No, there's a consistency to my prayer life. It's in the morning. You're going to hear my voice morning by morning. The second thing he would say then is, and I'm going to direct my prayer to you. And the word direct means a well thought out strategy. Amen. It's war. It's strategy. And, and he brings it back to another scripture. Let me get my notes on that. He brings it back to a scripture over in Judges chapter 20 in verses 20 through 23. And you see the Israelites going out against the enemy three times. And each time there was strategy to the way they were advancing against the enemy. So he was saying, Lord, in the morning, you're going to hear me. I'm going to be consistent. I'm going to be there constantly, you know, seeking your face in the morning. And I'm going to have a well thought out strategy for prayer. I'm not just going to go, hmm. Um, let's see, I hope you do this and I hope you do that. No, he was basically saying, that, you know, I'm, I'm going to have strategy. In other words, do you know what to pray over healing? Do you know what promises to claim? How many of you watched War Room? The movie War Room. What an incredible movie. I'll tell you, if you want a good picture of intercession that is laid out in strategy, in warfare, go see that movie. Because that movie has got it right there, man. She had sticky notes with the scripture and sticky notes for the kids and sticky notes for everything. And I loved it, didn't you? And I thought, God, how wonderful that we can have a visual of what it's really like to direct our prayer to you in the morning. It was a well thought out scriptural strategy of what God's promise was and what we can do to win and what we can put our faith on to. Isn't that powerful? And so God's saying, you know, you know, he wants us to have a strategy that has purpose and it has meaning to it. So that was the first thing I wanted you to see about prayer. That's one pattern of prayer I wanted you to see. Now let's go over to Proverbs chapter 3. One of our favorite scriptures as well. Verses 5 and 6. And it says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Oh, there's that word direct again. But this word direct has a different meaning. It's a different Hebrew word, actually. But let's look at, first of all, acknowledge. He said in all of your, I'm sorry, look at the word ways. In all of your ways. And what does the word straight uh, ways mean there? It means in all of your straightness, in all of your goings acknowledge God. Yeah. Actually, it can mean that God is going to make opportunities available for you throughout the day to hook up with him, yeah. to have an, an interlude with him, yeah. to have a, a point of intersection with him. And when he does, acknowledge him. Yeah. But what does the word acknowledge mean? It doesn't mean, hey, good to see you today. I'm really glad to hook up with you today. No, it didn't mean that kind of acknowledgement. And it didn't mean the kind of knowledge that meant acknowledgement in the sense of knowledge or Sophia or understanding or wisdom. No, it didn't mean that either. In actuality, it, it's more than an observation. It's more than investigation. It's more than a reflection. It's a firsthand experience. In other words, when a man and a woman come together in marriage, what they have a they they have an acknowledgement of one another. If you were going to use the the Hebrew word for acknowledgement, there you would say that when they were intimate, and with the purpose of conception, it would be that in all thy ways acknowledge him. In other words, allow him to hover over you in such a way that that life-giving spirit that's in him can cause a conception in you of what's in his heart. 
That's what that means. Isn't that powerful? Never so, let him hover over you. And let him birth something there. Now, as in every intimate situation, there's going to be a time of conception, and then there's finally going to have to be a birthing. And God is intimately involved with you in both situations. And tonight, John's going to talk more about the second part of that, his hovering to enable us to birth it forth, not just conceive it, but to actually bring birth to it then, which sometimes, um, you, you know, a lot of times, people want to, sometimes they want to play music when we're praying, and that works sometimes, like in worship praying and things like that. But ladies, how many of you have given birth to a child? Uh huh. And what did you want happening while you were in there? Um, did you did you want people running around doing things? Did you want the doctor to say get up and go for a walk as you were getting ready to that baby was separating the pelvic bones and that baby was birth canal. I can tell you a funny story. When we were having our second one, I think it was, I don't know, or third, whatever. We had four children. You lose track, don't you ladies? You know, you think, I'll never forget this. But what's the scripture say? In the morning the pain is forgotten because of the joy of having a child. Well, I, I don't know that that's really accurate. You know I me. Mean? I just want to, as a woman, I would just like to take you on point with that and say, not sure about that. I still remember some things. How about you? <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, all of a sudden, just as the baby was getting ready to come, as we were birthing one of ours, John and the doctor found out they were in Vietnam at the same time. Oh, fascinating. No. What hill were you on? What hill were you on? Well, what? Uh, and I'm having a baby. You, you know? Uh, you know, I don't mean to be vile or unclean. It's just natural. So, ladies, you remember when sometimes they run their hands around, you know, to help that baby come out? He was doing that and hitting every nerve that I didn't even know existed in my body. <laughs> and they're going, oh, and I was on him. And I said, hello, or something like that. And John said, now, now, let's see a little new creation realities. <laughs> I'm all Kelly when I got out of here. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you what you just said. <laughs> it was good. I was the original coward. I, I got on the word, and I'm just telling you this right now. I heard so many horror stories about having a baby that, that you know, I was just thought, I don't know if I can have a baby or not. And then God said to me one day, if it was that bad, how do you think everybody had more than one? I went, oh, yeah, that's good, God. That's good. <laughs> So I got on the word. I create. I got all my scriptures together, and I had every one of my babies under four hours. Not because I was so fond of doing it by faith, but because I was a coward. <laughs> it worked. Hallelujah. It worked. Praise God. In all our ways, acknowledge. You know, God's there not just to bring the conception of his heart and his mind, his purpose, his destiny for your life within you, but also to help you then pray that thing out. And how many of you know it doesn't get prayed out in one session, normally speaking? You know, you, you may think, I'll go to, I remember Brother Hagen always used to say, try to take 10 or 15 minutes a day and just ask God to pray, to give you the, function, the, the Holy Ghost tongues to pray over your future. And so I would do that so often. I would just say, Holy Father, I just need to pray over my future right now. And I ask you right now to give me the language, give me the right words. And I would just hit it for about 10 or 15 minutes. I would just hit it. And I asked God one time, I said, why has my life been blessed? I've been, I haven't had a lot of things that a lot of people have had. And God told me, he said, because you've prayed your way into your future. You, you know, he said, you prayed and I was there waiting for you when you got there. I already had things and people set in order. 
That's powerful. That's powerful. And so we can do that for our lives. Like God can help us. And so he, you know, but it didn't always. I'm, I'm, I'm. Not, let me see how to say this. I never just prayed. Oh, 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, that took care of the rest of my life. <laughs> How I wish, would that have been great? But no, maybe I prayed through a little bit of it. Sometimes, you know, you should pray until there's a victory over a situation. Well, I would pray, but, you know, there wouldn't be a victory right then. And I'd have to pray again the next day and the next day. And sometimes I would pray for a long time and never got a victory for a long time, just depending on what we were praying over. Because why? Because a lot of times you're dealing with people's human wills. And I'm telling you right now, it's easier to pray for that chair to move right there all by itself than it is to pray for some people's will. Because, you know, some people, they're just plumb stubborn, not me. But, I mean, you know, some people are, not you, but some people are. And so God knows how to touch people. And we don't a lot of times. And so when we put them in the hands of God and we say, and we refuse to speak the negative over their lives, even those that are creating the biggest glitch in your life, ticking you to no end, don't say anything bad about them. Say what the Word says about them and then say, God, give me tongues. Help me to birth something new, something good into their life, God. You know, some people have nobody praying for them, really. Nobody known like we do. How many of you have somebody else that prays for you? You know, oh, dear God, I'm so grateful. We have warriors in RFI. We have eight of them. And they pray a minimum of 10 and 12 hours a week. I mean, just, I'm so grateful for them. So much has been avoided in our lives because of them. Okay? And so, I, I'm so thankful. So, you know, when people are creating the biggest problems for you, it may be because God's saying, wake up. There's nobody praying for them. They haven't had what you've had. They don't know what you have. Sometimes, I don't know about you, but I just think everybody knows what we know. Hello. That's a dumb thought right there. I'm just telling you. People don't know what we know. We're so blessed to have been born in the Word of Faith ministry where a time when the knowledge of God was so covering the earth at that time. So God wants us to birth things, and he wants to hover over us. So in closing, he wants us to acknowledge. Let me just read this reference here. It says, uh, when it talks about in all of our ways acknowledge him, this refers to the life-giving um, resource as in marriage applied to a spiritual contest it suggests an intimacy with God in prayer that conceives and births blessings and victories and so um, in Proverbs our ways will as we conclude as we acknowledge him in all of our ways and in all of our days then guess what we're going to have that intimate contact with God that will enable us to bring his life-giving flow into the circumstances of our lives that are really pretty much dead I don't know if you have anything dead in here in your life maybe it's a marriage maybe it's dead finances maybe parts of your body are not living as they should but you know, letting God hover over you Maybe it's ministry for some. Then letting God hover over you will cause him to enable you to conceive and to birth holy things in the earth. God bless you. Thank you. Praise the Lord. The one thing I, I will say about my wife, uh, I have never, as her pastor as well, as her husband, I've never had to encourage her to pray or read her Bible. And the 42 years we've been together and the 36 years that I've been a pastor and she's been my co-pastor. Never have I ever had to encourage my wife to pray. I've never seen her backslide. Never seen her backslide. Ever. In, 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 in our life. I, I just can't tell you what a faithful woman of God she is. And he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Amen. Now I could go into that scripture because I have some real revelation on that one. But I want to look at Hebrews 6 for just a few minutes by kind of by way of testimony tonight. And then we're going to pray for a while. Yeah. Amen. You know, if you, if you call a meeting to have prophecy laying on hands, we're going to do that next Sunday night at our church in Fairmont. We told them all, come on out. We're going to lay hands on everybody and pray, prophesy over everybody. Well, we'll probably have a great attendance. 
<laughs> you know, typically that's what happened. But, uh, but what, when you call for a prayer meeting, you know what happens, right? The numbers shrink drastically because people just don't realize the power of prayer. And like one man of God said, prayer is the most untapped resource of the church. The most untapped resource of the church. And if you and I could learn to do anything, if we could learn to pray, we would have learned the most important thing that we could ever do. And, and the ability to tap the greatest resource that, that's available. James said the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man availeth much, or, or one translation said makes much power available. Yeah. Fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man makes much power available. Yeah. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Well, now let me give you a little, little backdrop. And then we're going to spend a little time praying. We're going to pray over the church, over the ministry of the church here, over departments, whatever. We're going to just get into that spirit of prayer. Because we've been in a prayer revival since 2008. Yeah. Now, again, if you if you if you put out a sign out there, healing revival, you probably get some interested people. But if you put a sign out there that said prayer revival, people would say, "What's that about?" You know, forget that prayer revival. You know. And and I, I'll tell you why the church, by large, has been I won't say prayerless, but way beneath the level of prayer that we should be operating in to get the results that we ask God for and want. And Jesus said, could you not tarry one hour? Yeah. The spirit indeed is willing, but what? The flesh is weak. The, flesh is weak. Yeah. the reason we don't have the kind of prayer life in our individually or corporately is because of the flesh. We're easily overcome by our flesh. Spirit man's easily overcome by the flesh. So hardest thing you will ever do is to pray for an hour. Isn't it? You know, you get started out an hour, you get started out, and now you start thinking about this and that and get distracted, take a break, write a few notes from something you have to do and you know it's not working too good. Put some music on, try to worship a while, you know, you know. But, but to cultivate a spirit of prayer in your life where you can pray an hour just like any other exercise in your life, I wonder what percentage of Christians in the body of Christ have ever reached that goal where they pray an hour every single day, a minimum of an hour every single day. Well, if you want to know why we don't see the result from coming from the church to change and transform society, it's simply right there. So you and I can't point the finger at anybody. We've got to point it right back here. Yeah. What's my prayer life like? Uh -huh. Like somebody said, uh, the guy was telling about prayer, and he, he used to get up in the morning to pray, and, and then he started going to bed late, so he couldn't get up in the morning. So uh, he started praying at night before bed, and then he was too tired. And so he started writing notes to God. You know this story. He started writing a note to God and putting that note there on his bedstand. And and then he, you know, he'd uh, he'd read that prayer. And then finally, he just he got so lazy. He just said, "Lord, you can read it yourself. Good night." <laughs> it's pretty pitiful, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty pitiful. Well. We've been in the ministry 36 years full time without a break and interruption at all. 36 years. And we've done a lot of praying. We prayed, We were praying for an hour way back when, an hour every day, years and years and years ago. We've had all night prayer meetings. We have them now, at least once a month, an all night prayer meeting. We, we do a three day fast every month, the first Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, every month, and bring the church together to pray for an hour each night on a three-day fast every month. Then we have prayer every day at our staff meeting, half hour every day through the week. Our staff stops everything, and they pray for half hour together before they go eat lunch. I mean, it's just pray, pray, pray. Then we have our intercessors, the, the group of intercessors that pray for RFI that pray all those hours every week. They're on conference phone calls every day, our, our trained intercessors praying, praying, praying. Why? Because Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of now think about this. Are you the house of God? Yes. We're not talking about the church building. Yeah. We're talking about the body of Christ right. is the house of God. Yeah. So the number one identifier of the house of God is prayer. Yeah. 
My house shall be called a house of prayer. The primary characteristic and identifier of a Christian should be their prayer life. The primary identifier of the corporate body of Christ, the house of the Lord, as we are tonight, should be our prayer. Yes. But most places it's the preaching. Uh, my house shall be called a house of prayer. No. Preach in the house. You're supposed to do that. My house shall be called a house of praise and worship. No. Uh, those are not the number one identifiers of the church. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Number one identifier. Of the church. God said my church should be known for prayer. That's right. The only thing that God said to do in the tabernacle was to keep the incense burning. Yeah. Incense is a type of prayer. He said that should be burning 24-7. Don't let the incense go out. That's right. Don't let the prayer life diminish whatsoever in your life. But that's the first thing that goes out the window in many Christians' life is prayer. The second thing goes out is their giving. Once the prayer and the giving is gone out, you're toast. Yeah, that's right. You, you're pretty much an unprofitable servant, as the Bible yeah. says in the Bible. That's strong. And of course, all you people here, none of you are in that category. You're here on Sunday night. Yeah. But it says in Hebrews chapter 6, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection. And perfection means completion or maturity. So he says, let's go, let's leave the elementary doctrines of Christ and let's go on to maturity now. And then the rest of Hebrews, he gets into the teaching, chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, he gets into the teaching of the tabernacle. And so the tabernacle, the revelation of the tabernacle is the message of maturity. Amen. And you understand a tabernacle, this is what brings you to maturity in Christ. In Hebrews chapter 8 and 9, it talks about the tabernacle having three compartments, the outer court, the inner court, and the, the holiest of all, right? One, two, three, right? And and so everything in the kingdom of God is in three, three is three dimensional. It's in three phases. Hallelujah. Glory. Okay. Mark chapter four, verse twenty six through twenty eight, so is the kingdom of God. So is the kingdom of God. As if a man should cast four seed in the ground, he sleeps and rises at night, day springs, goes up, he knows not how. First the blade, then the corn, then the full corn in the ear. One, two, three. Yeah. Now, he said first the blade, then the corn. Babyhood, yeah. childhood, yeah. manhood. Yeah. That's that third dimension is manhood. That, that's third dimension is maturity. We move through that tabernacle. First Jesus, we get saved, the outer court. Then we move to the Holy Ghost in the inner court, get filled with the Spirit. This is adolescence. We're going from babyhood to childhood. But in that third dimension is full sonship. That's manhood. Yeah. Babyhood, childhood, manhood. Full, mature sonship. Yeah. The third dimension. See, many of us want to claim the harvest when we're still babies. We want to claim the harvest when we're still children. The harvest doesn't come into our life until we reach manhood. Because he said, first the blade, then the cord, then the full corn in the air. After that, when the harvest has come, you put in the sickle. Yeah. The most productive time of your life will be the time that you reach manhood in Christ. Amen. It won't be your spiritual child, your spiritual baby, or childhood. It's, it's your manhood in Christ. It's your maturity. And that's what the message of the tabernacle is all about. Growing up, let us go on to perfection. So, so there's many different things we can look at. Just like I said, the, the, the Godhead, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Father. Well, isn't that how we grow up? We first get saved, we meet Jesus, right? Jesus is our Savior. Then we get filled with the Holy, get to know the Holy Ghost. Finally, we start growing up, we really get to know the Father and understand the heart of the Father and relate to Him as Father. That's maturity in Christ. So many things, like the anointing, the anointing within us when we're born again. You get filled with the Holy Ghost and the power of God starts coming upon us. That's the anointing upon us, second dimension. But the third dimension is the glory of God yeah. in that third level. In the outer court, you have faith. In the inner court, you have hope. But in that third dimension, you have love. The Bible said love is the greatest. So the third dimension is the greatest. Manhood is the greatest. Hallelujah. Come on. In the outer court, you have, you have thanksgiving. In the inner court, you have praise. And in that third dimension is worship. Worship. The third dimension, 
maturity is the greatest dimension. It's the greatest. It's where harvest is. It's where your full productivity is in your life. That's why it's so important that you grow up spiritually. Let us go on unto perfection, he said. Let us move on. If you read Hebrews 5, the end of the chapter, verses 12 through 14, he said, by this time, you should be teachers. But you have need again that someone teach you the very first principles of the doctrines of Christ. Let us move on. In other words, I can hear the voice of the Spirit saying, for crying out loud. <laughs> Let us move on. It's time to grow up. Yeah. See, babyhood, babies, talking to somebody about this morning. Babies, they want to know everything. Yeah. You know? That's why when kids, we lived on a, on a hill. My dad worked for Michigan Limestone, the division of U.S. Steel up in western Pennsylvania. And, and we lived on something called the dump. Yeah, it was a hill that, that had company houses on the top, and on the other end was the dump. And so we lived on the hill in these company houses, and there was hills on both sides. And my mother would let us outside. My, my older brother, man, I was a baby. My older brother, and she'd tie him to a tree so he wouldn't fall off one of them hills. And, and, and so, you know, she used to tell stories about he was tied to a tree. He only had about six feet to roam around that tree. So don't you know, he investigated everything within that circumference. I mean, every bug, every worm. He, you know, babies, they want to know everything. They're curious. That's why he said, if babies coming over, put stuff up, man, because they they're going to open the closets. They're going to go in the kitchen and open the, they're going to get in the garbage. Well, not a good parallel for baby Christians still getting in the garbage. Okay. So, so you know, the fact is, babies, listen, babies want to know, but children, when we become adolescents, we want to do. Isn't it true? Yes. You want to do. You know, check this out in your own life. When you're a baby Christian, you're just happy to, to learn, to be taught. You want to learn. You want to know, no, 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 no. But then you start growing, then you want to start doing something. Yeah. You, exp you want to express the fact that, hey, I, I know something now. Yeah. You know, Mom, I don't drive the car. I do it myself. You don't have to tell me everything. This is when we start getting independent toward our leadership. When we reach that adolescent stage, you know, and they're still trying to teach us. Oh, wait, I, already, I know God's been telling me all that. Hello. And, 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 but then, you know, babies want to know, children want to do, but mature adults want to be. You want to be. It's what you be that matters, not what you know and what you do. A lot of people know and do, but they haven't become yet. It's what you become. And, and isn't that the third dimension? The third dimension is when you have become something. Praise God. A mature son and daughter of God who has knows the, the whole triune God. The, the, listen, the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwelleth in you. Yes. You got revelation of the Son, you got a revelation of the Holy Ghost, you got the revelation of the Father. The fullness of the Godhead is dwelling in you. Yes. It was in Jesus. Amen? Yes. Okay, so what I'm talking about, I'm talking about growing up, coming to maturity in the tabernacle is the pattern for coming to maturity because it's in three compartments and all of life moves through those three phases. It doesn't make no difference what it is. Amen. Even if it's the gifts of the Holy Ghost in the outer court, you got prophetic gifts. In the inner court, you got revelation gifts and that third dimension is where the power gifts are. Amen. Woo! Glory, come on. Miracles, Amen. signs, and wonders. Amen. See, uh, Ezekiel saw it. He said, water is to the ankle, and then it's to the knees, and then it's to the loins. I mean, it's just all three, three, three everywhere. Well, we discovered this in prayer. When we this prayer revival hit us, I'm sharing this with you as a background before we do a little praying. Uh, it was night. It was 2008. I, I shared this last time I was here, but I know there's some folks probably weren't here and didn't hear this. 2008. I I got convicted. We used to have prayer in the prayer room at church on Sunday, where we could get loud and pray in tongues, and but we didn't want to scare the visitors. And, and so we prayed in the prayer room. Well, one day uh, the Holy Spirit convicted me. He said, John, my house should be called a house of prayer. It should be identified by prayer. Amen. Okay? And I understand, you know, throwing the people in the deep end of the pool who've never heard anybody wailing and travailing, and they, they come into church and you're wailing and travailing, and they break out and think you're, you know, losing your mind. But I understand all that. But the Lord... He convicted me.
He said, should we come to the house of prayer? And I said, you know, we're going to bring prayer into the sanctuary. I'm not saying everybody should do what we did. He said, I'm going to bring prayer. I want you, I'm going to bring prayer into the sanctuary on Sunday morning. We have 55 minutes of prayer from 9 to 10.55 and 9.55 every Sunday morning. It's prayer school. We teach prayer by precept and example. Remember that phrase? Kenneth yeah. Hagin. By precept and example. You learn more about praying by praying yeah. with somebody that has a prayer anointing in their life than any other thing. Yeah. More is caught than taught. Yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. That's why you need to get to the prayer meeting. Because you're going to catch something. That's the whole idea. Until you've caught that impartation, it's a part of your life. Amen. You don't. You, you can. You can bring that prayer anointing in anywhere you are. Okay. So, so I moved prayer into the into the sanctuary on Sunday morning, and we for two weeks we prayed in the sanctuary on Sunday morning. And on the third week, I'm I'm walking around the platform praying, praying in the spirit, and people are praying. And, and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, "I'm going to honor you." I'm going to honor you. And I thought, you're going to honor me? wonder what you're going to do. I had no clue. All he said is, I'm going to honor you. Well, the following week, this was, this was in June of 2008. The following week, we have a week of prayer and fasting schedule for our summer convention for Revival Fellowship, which was going to be held in Asheville, North Carolina in 2008. So I had asked people to join me for a week of fasting and praying every night. So we come in there Monday night. And, and, and this fire fell on that Monday night, and that honor showed up. This, this fire fell, and it was like the room turned into a maternity ward. And it's funny you were talking about that tonight, you know, into a maternity ward, and I was like the doctor, okay? And, 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 and what was happening was this fire fell on me, and God had me start laying hands on people, and everybody I laid hands on was like someone punched them in the belly. And they double over this way and down forward and were groaning. And this went on. Everybody, they're, they're just, everybody is down on their bellies. Wow. Okay. And, and, and the funny thing about it was there was a different protocol to this anointing. So you got to understand protocol of the spirit. Like in the charismatic renewal, when somebody get under a burden, we'd say, what would people do? Two or three people go over and lay hands on them and help birth it. Well, this doesn't work that way. We found out right away when someone was travailing and this whale was going through them, if somebody come over and touched them, it stopped instantly. And it's like the Lord said, don't touch this one. Just don't touch it. And so what we'll do is somebody's under that fire and we get two or three people to just point in that direction. And it was like, what? They just pointed in that direction and it would intensify amazingly Amen. the power of it. This went on every night that week. Every night. So we went to Asheville and had our meeting, and it fell on some preachers down there. And then we come back home and said, gee, I wonder if this is going to continue. I wonder if it was just for the, the camp meeting, for the conference. We'd come back home. We started prayer meetings on Tuesday and Friday night. For two years, every Tuesday and Friday night, we had this fire fall. And it was the same whale, the same travail, the same in labor-intensive prayer. And then people started getting tired because we had other things going on, so we just moved back to Tuesday night, one night a week. Now we have taken that thing, has gone to churches, has gone overseas, and we've started a prayer fire in every county of West Virginia. I just finished last Saturday night in Wood County, West Virginia, and asked churches to come. We had seven churches gather prayer, and we, we just loosed this thing and loosed that prayer fire. We're taking it to every county in the state of West Virginia. Wow. God told me to light it up, light up the state. And others are doing similar things like Dutch Sheets and various people. And Franklin Graham is now doing these big prayer meetings. Man, this is the call to prayers out. Come on. The call to prayer is gone out to the body of Christ. Okay. So, uh, what I asked God about it, you know, and it's gone on to this day from 2008 till now. My prayer anointing has changed. I don't go, I don't go back to the way I prayed. It has changed. It's an impartation. It's changed. And so I asked God about it. He said, John, this is third dimension prayer. Because in the outer court, you pray in English. The inner court, you pray in tongues. But the third dimension, once you get in that third dimension, it goes beyond tongues. Praying beyond tongues. And it, it is, it, the Bible says about Romans chapter 8, 
It's groaning which cannot be uttered. There's no words for this. Sometimes it's just, ah! It's a wail. It's a cry. It's a scream. It's a shout. It's so intense. And this is the level of prayer that the church is at. This is the fervent effectual prayer that is going to bring the changes and bring the difference. And if there's any reason we haven't seen the breakthroughs, it's for this reason. Most of the church lives in the outer court. Some have moved past into the inner court. But there's very few that have gone into the third dimension that really have wanted, wanted to grow up and come to maturity that actually actually manifest the third dimension characteristics that I've mentioned tonight. They walk in love. They are in intimate worshipers. These are third dimension things. Right? That, there's very few that, 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 that have come to maturity. To be quite frankly, I've been a pastor for 36 years. And all around the place, man. And, and, I, and, I, and I, I can take the temperature pretty good of a church and, and of believers. You just, you just learn. And the church desperately needs to move to maturity. As I taught this morning. And, and the church needs to get into that third dimension. But there's one big thing that separates the second room of the tabernacle from the third room. And what was it? A big veil. And what does that veil represent? The flesh. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was rent from the top to the bottom. It was symbolizing that this is a work of God. It's God who is going to open that way for you into that third dimension. Hallelujah. And he did that. He, he's done that. He's been taking the church from the second dimension to the third dimension for the last probably 10 years now. And it's an exciting, exciting time that we're living in. The prayer level has gone to another dimension. So the third level, the third dimension of prayer is beyond tongues. And but see, your flesh won't let you do that. If you're conscious of self and you just won't give yourself to the spirit, you'll stay in that outer court. You just got to let it come out of you. Just let that roar come out. Let that will come out because I want this thing. When you let that out, that's when you've caught it. That's when you've caught it. It stays with you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So we're going to pray a little while. Amen. We're not, I'm not, you're not going to spectate and watch me now. That's not what this is about. I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. And we're going to pray. And, and I'm going to have my wife come pray. And then, I, I, if it's okay, Pastor Steve, then I might, I might call on one of you and hand you this microphone to pray over a particular thing. We're going to pray over, over the, the church and over your pastors, over the leadership of your church, over the children's ministry. Hallelujah. Come on, go ahead and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost right there. <laughs> Hallelujah! Hey, hey! Oh! Woo! Shorabahataya Masai! Shorabahataya Masai! Woo! Sangarabahataya Masai! Shorabahataya Masai! Woo! Ha ha! Hallelujah! Hey, hey! Ha ha! Woo! Shalabarata Basada Mahataya 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 Mahataya Basada Hallelujah! Hey, hey! Oh, ha ha! Ha ha! Woo! 
Father, we pray for Steve Nicholson, the apostle of this ministry right now. You keep praying in tongues when I pray in English. We pray for Steve, Father God, as the apostolic leader of this house, Father God. Lord, Shalabaratai, with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of Jesus. Woo, Shalabakataya, Messiah. Oh, Lakata. Oh, Lakataya. Oh, Lakatia. Shalabahataya, Messiah, Makaya. Woo, hey, hey. Aha. Woo, hallelujah. Woo, Shalabahataya, Messiah. Shalabakataya, Messiah, Mahataya, Messiah. Shalabarata, Messiah, Mahataya, Messiah. Shalabarata. Woo, Sandabahata. Oh, Lakataya, Messiah. Woo, ha ha. Ah, sa. Ah, ha ha. Woo, Shalabahata. Woo, Shalabakataya, Messiah. Eh, hey. Ha ha. Shalabahata, Lakata. Shalakata.
Shola Bakataya Masaya, Lola Katia Masaya, Shola Barataya Masaya, Hey, hey!
Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come by and eat. Yes, come by wine and milk without money and without price. It's a cry of the Holy Ghost. And, and the Bible says in, in Hebrews 5 that Jesus, Jesus prayed with loud crying and tears. Yes. Loud right. crying and tears. It's a cry. Yes. Cry aloud, Isaiah 54, and spare not. Oh, <laughs> woo, hey, hey. <laughs> woo, yeah, yeah, man. I believe this is a third dimension level of prayer. Yeah. This is labor intensive prayer. Yeah. And, and, and when you get a bunch of people together flowing in that third dimension, it is incredible the yeah. level of power and intensity and the breakthroughs that come every five minutes the breakthrough comes and it erupts and people are clapping and shouting because we, we, we know that one's been done and it just yeah. it don't take as long with that level of power. It don't take as long to get the breakthrough. Woo! Show Amen? Well, praise the Lord. Thanks, Steve, for letting us share and, and, and pray with your people tonight. God bless you. Praise God. I have a word for, uh, for the Lord for some of you. The word of the Lord is to you. Some of you have been wondering why you haven't received your miracle yet. You've been standing for a miracle. And the Lord says you're not aggressive enough. He says you're just letting it go by you. And because you're not aggressive you, and not pressing in, and, you know, um, in prayer and getting over in the dimension that we're talking about, because of that, your miracle's not happening. But it is over in that realm. And that you can get it for yourself over in that realm it's not just through the books of confession and you know i can say to some people in particular i've seen different ones over the years i'm not necessarily talking to anybody in here but i've seen folks and i'm not criticizing faith and confession because i'm a faith man believe in it but i've seen them stand and confess the word for two years and never get a miracle why? Because it's head knowledge and not heart faith. And heart faith has to be produced through aggressive Christianity. It cannot be produced without that third dimension. It cannot come without that. And you know, I notice a lot of people, and I say this very humbly, get sick around me. And, and I'm not criticizing, you know. I mean, by the grace of God, I, I don't get sick. There's been years where I had sickness, even th two to three years ago, I was sick for a week once and, and it was serious and, and week another time. And I have fought with being attacked here and there, but I found that when my prayer life is like this, when it's up, no matter what's coming around, people might get sick and all that stuff, but I just don't. And why is it? Because I'm right there where all the miracles are happening. I pray in that realm. I live in that realm. Okay, and I, and I know a lot of healing scripture. And occasionally I'll get back in it if I feel something attacking me. But the Lord said the miraculous realm that we have been expecting, not just individually but corporately, is in that prayer realm. And so the signs and wonders and miracles and breakthroughs financially for prosperity, for deliverance, for ourselves, for anything like addictions or anything, we need to pray for people for their deliverances, their healings, their miracles, even when they're not in this building, when we know that they need it. Because this kind of prayer will go where they are and it will break the yoke that's been dogging them for years. The anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. Isaiah 10, 27. And that's the anointing. That's what we've been missing sometimes as a corporate church. We need it as a corporate church. You know, pastors can be blessed all they want, but if the church is not blessed, pastors are bummed. 
I'm just telling you, it bums me out. I'd rather be, you know, which is in scripture, I'd rather be impoverished and everybody be blessed. But the thing is, is I have to be blessed and live that life in order for you guys to be blessed and live that life. And I'm getting more and more convicted on that and fired up about that this year. This year is breaker year. It's a breaker year. The Lord gave me that word. It's, it's the year that 1916, God said, I'm going to do a lot of fixing. Fixing in 1916. Or 2016. I'm doing a lot. Well, he did back then. No, I don't know. In 2016, he's doing a lot of fixing. What does that mean? He's fixing the government. He's fixing the church. He's fixing to get ready to come back. He's fixing to pour out prosperity. He's fixing. That's good. That's the that's, that's southern talk. He's fixing to heal the body of Christ and equip them to go out and do the works of Christ. Amen. And so take that for yourself and make a habit of a prayer time. Maybe you say, well, I can't pray an hour in the morning. Well, get up and, and spend some time praying to the Lord. You know, spend some time before you do anything in your day. Spend some time, maybe in English, talking to God and praying in the Spirit. But whatever's a good time for you, and even if it isn't, carve it out. Because I found that, you know, over the years, I've always carved out time for God. I there's been times where I would pray two hours every day in other tongues. And I always noticed I was the most blessed at that time. <laughs> so true. Yeah, and, but right now I make a minimum of an hour every day, and then I always end up praying about an hour and a half usually because that's when it gets, that's, right. that's when I get in that realm, in the holy place. And, you know, I find myself at the end of those prayers praising the Lord and worshiping the Lord and, it's just, I can't help but praise and worship after that. Because it's so good to be close to God. Amen? And so we're going to stick with this. Amen? Yes. Make yourself a time every day. And we're going to talk about when we can meet for prayer on a regular basis, too. Dr. John. Can I add, to Steve, to, to what you're saying about the Word and the Spirit? You know, the Bible says the Father seeketh such to worship Him in spirit and in truth. So we need to plumb the depths of the word. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? It's spirit and in truth, the anointing and the word. Yeah. We need to plumb the depths of the word. We need to be people who have the word of faith and who know how to speak to the mountains and who's confess the word of God. We need to understand all the applications and uses of the word. Yeah. But at the same time, we need to understand all the realms of the spirit. Yeah. Exactly. And the depths of the spirit. That's what yeah. I'm talking about, getting into the depths of, of prayer that, that a lot of Brother Hagen people like that, unless some of those guys knew all about that, Smith yeah. Wigglesworth, they, they lived in those realms. Oh, yeah. And, and he, they, have, they haven't taken it with them when they went to heaven. They left it here. Now, we need to be plumbing the depths of the Spirit, and, and, and you do that in prayer. Amen. You can't go any further in the things of the Spirit than you've gone in your prayer life. That's right. That's why you're most blessed. When, no wonder Paul said, I pray in tongues more than y'all, and I wish you were all like me. I mean, he learned it. This is where it all comes from. Yeah. You know, so it, it's, I hear what, I heard what you were saying. We don't want to minimize the place of the word and the use of the word in our life. But if, you, if you're out of balance, and that's all, it, like I said, 20 years just confessing the word, but never plumbed the depths of the spirit, he seeketh such a worship him in spirit and in truth, the anointing and the word. That's really good. Excellent, excellent word, amen. And you know, we're we're trying to equip with that that side of the word. This church is a word church, and I'm proud that we are a word church. Um, but Brother Hagen, one of the things he even said, he said the the last the greatest move of God is in the last days would be lost to many people in the church if they don't continue to flow in the spirit along with the word he said many word churches have dried up because they've not flowed in the spirit and they dry up and they're gone or they dry up and they're dead on the vine i for one am not going to be one of those people how about you i don't think we are are we 
Amen. We're not going to be. And we're going to have some exciting things ahead. Amen. She said, remember, I immediately saw the three dimensions of the spirit fulfilled in you and flowing out of you. So you're, yeah, man, you're going to bring all three levels of the anointing, you know, the outer court, the inner court, the voice of you're going to bring it all. Because that's all in the river. You can't, you can't have the river without all three. You just have a stream. <clears throat> but, but God's saying all three are, are flowing in you and that word. Amen. Praise God. I received that. Glory to God. Praise the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the river of life, Lord. It froze from the streams of the city of God, Lord. The streams bless those and make them glad that come to it and drink, Lord. In Jesus' name. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, praise you, praise you, praise you. Oh, wellspring of life, flowing rivers, flowing rivers, flowing brooks of life. <laughs> Artesian wells, amen. Artesian wells are being built in, in this church. Wells are being dug and built, and they're being done through prayer. There'll be wells everywhere in this place, and people will fall into them. And they'll get into them and they won't want to get out. Because it'll be like Jacob's well. It'll be full of the rivers drinking of life. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. I received that. You guys received that for yourself, too. Because it's, you're part of everything we do. Amen. And so we're part of what they do and you're part of what we do. Praise God. Store of the breach, you know. So many of the truths that have been lost, uh, or, or they're they're shady now, you know. The truths that when Wigglesworth and so many were not, they're not bright. There, they're not shining, you know. In Revelation, but God says you'll be known as a restorer. Those things as well. God. Praise God. Hey, what a team you are! What a connection, God said I've made in the two of you. What a connection. When you'll stand and, and the truth, I just see it pouring out of your mouth like a fountain. And everywhere it pours, God says, you're, you are given to me. And God said, uh, in these latter days, you'll become more and more and more uh, pourable here and pourable there. And God says, uh, I'm going to move you around sometimes. It's not going to, I'm going to take you out of your comfort zones because I'm going to need you to pour over here and then I'm going to need you to pour over there. And so God just says, you just stay adaptable to me and I'll cause your life to be enriched yeah. and, and you'll pour truth. And wherever that truth is poured, God says, I'm going to cause life to spring up and, and that life will magnify and bring him glory. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. These are things that we need to be praying over. That happen. Amen. Yeah. I see Bible studies springing up. Bible studies? Yeah, Bible studies springing up here, springing up there, springing up over here. And they're going to evolve, too. Some of them are going to evolve into more churches. 
you know, because God says, I've used you before, and I'll use you again, and I'll call a structure. I've been adding more to you and more wisdom as you've been here in one location. But God says, as you plant over here and you plant over there, they're not going to be just Bible studies. They're also going to be churches. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you, I Jesus. received that. That's, that's awesome. Praise God. Praise God. That's really interesting because one of the things that the Lord gave us about this year going out and, and maybe doing some kind of care group things and, and um, start to expand in that area of, of going to different people's houses and going into different places. And, you know, praise God. And I know he means pass that too, but but that's you guys, so you be praying for yourselves too. Praise God. Well, did you get something tonight? Amen. Life changing. Amen. Not just another word. This is life changing stuff. If we act on this, it's life changing. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, the Lord spoke to me when I was a little bit younger, well, right before we got married, and he said he was going to exalt my wife in ministry first, which he did. And I was on a lawnmower cutting a, a guy's lawnmower. It was your stepdad, or your father, whatever, stepdad. And uh, he said, you know, you're focused more on Kenneth Hagin type material in the beginning of your ministry. But he said, later on, you're going to focus more on the evangelists and the men of God like Lester Summerall and Smith Wigglesworth. He said that 27 years ago. And no one's ever said anything about that until now. So, praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God is good. Glory to God. Thank you. Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. Well, um, let's have our blushers. Or, I mean, ushers, sorry. I don't want to mess with this moment. It's awesome. Uh, but if you, uh, we would like to receive an evening offering for uh, Dr. John and Dr. Rebecca. And if you haven't had a chance to give today and you would like to give tonight, Please lift your hand if you, or if you feel like to give more. God bless you. Anything you give, write it out. Check to Faith Family. They will get every penny and more. Amen? Maybe you might say, well, I don't have enough money to give. I would say especially to you, give something, even if it's just a little bit. Especially if you have any financial needs, because... Um, I just know that this night there's a blessing on this offering. So it's just this little apostolic covering. It's like when when uh, Apostle Paul said, you know, I got blessings according to his riches and glory. That's that's a that's invoking a special blessing. When he says according to his riches in glory. That means he's invoking something special for the people that sat under his word and received of him and learned of him prophetically and, and by demonstration of the spirit of truth, power. And I think you can take that to the bank tonight. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Well, we're gonna we're gonna be talking about some prayer meetings coming up. Um, we we had done a fast and prayer time on prayer meeting one time, and man, it was like for three weeks every Saturday night prayer meeting. That same anointing was on us. It was it, when that night that we fast we did an all nighter, and we ended up about three hours of prayer, but we got. We got it on us, and I blew it because I said, well, 
you know, if you, if, if you guys want to go, you know, you can go now. And people later said, we, we all wanted to stay. Because you know how you get in that realm? And, and I blew it. And so we had another one. And I'm telling you, every Sunday service was like, I've never sensed an anointing on this church like that. I don't know if you remember that. Do you remember that? It was that kind of anointing. You, you, yeah, I know when I came into your church, I just walked in and I'm like, <laughs> you mean I could feel it right away. It was just a blowout. Not just like you're just staggering in, getting by type thing. It's like when you walked in there, if you were staggering, you were like, Phew. your eyes were open. The power of God was there. When praise started, you were in it. You didn't have to try to work it out. Yeah. So we're going to grow in that area. Amen? I want to be a doer of what my mentors are telling me and Pastor Sherry to do. Amen? Praise God. Do you need... Yes. Yeah, Wednesday at 10.30 in the morning and Saturday night at 7.30. And we're going to call more fasts coming up. Ready, you know. I, I'm losing weight and I'll just, just fast. It'll help me all more. Get closer to God and lose weight. Anyway, praise God. Everybody, uh, got down? Okay. Father, I just thank you so much for this whole time that we've been able to sit under these apostles of God. Lord, we humble ourselves and we wait for you to continue to work in every one of us to do of your good pleasure and your will, Lord, this year. That that which you've begun in us, even in these meetings alone, will be completed in Christ until you come. Energize it in us, Lord. Cause it to be something that we act upon and not just talk about. Give us the plans, Father, to fulfill and, and do these things. And we ask you to bless the gifts yes. and those that are being given to and the givers that give. Press down, shaking together, running over in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.